Rachel Callahan, the UC Statewide Agritourism Coordinator, and welcome to the Healthy Animals and Healthy People in Agritourism webinar. Just as a note, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted later for future views. Our agenda for the day, I will give a brief introduction into agritourism and the resources that are available from UC in agritourism. And then we will have Alda Perez, the Associate Professor of Cooperative Extension from the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, present a Biosecurity 101. Then we will have Juliet DeFrancesco, a postdoctoral researcher at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, present best practices for visitor interactions with animals. And then we will have Maureen Mikado, the owner operator of Mikado's Mini Acre, present the on the ground experience of an agritourism operator. And we will at the end have time for question and answer and exchange. Feel free to share your experiences as well. And as we go through the presentation, you may put your questions or comments into the chat function and we will address them. Um, and in the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. So what is agritourism? The University of California defines agritourism as a commercial enterprise conducted on a working farm or ranch for the enjoyment and education of visitors and that generates supplemental income. And we think about agritourism as having sort of five main categories on farm direct sales, educational experiences, entertainment events, accommodations, and recreation. So that just gives a little foundation about when you hear us say this term agritourism, what we mean. It's a pretty big umbrella and there's a lot of room for creativity in there. So why would you, a farmer or rancher engage in agritourism? Why would you invite people onto your land? And in the case of what we're talking about today, encourage them to interact with animals? Well, Agritourism can be a great way to increase your farm's profitability and diversify your income. It's also an excellent way to connect with customers, uh, feel connected to your community, and sell your farm products. And why would the public want to come to your land? Well, as I'm sure many of you know, the public is looking for these authentic experiences to engage with uh, the natural world, with where their food comes from, with animals, and so on. Um, and we're all always looking for something to do with our family on the weekends and in our spare time. And agritourism is a great way to uh, for the public to connect with uh, rural livelihoods. And there's also many benefits for the community in which agritourism operators are housed. Many times you are helping to bring visitors into your rural area and who will contribute to the economic base of that um, of your county and um, spend money in other ways. So there are many benefits to engaging in agritourism for everyone. And there are also many considerations to make when you're thinking about how to start or expand an agritourism enterprise on your property. And the UC Agritourism Program is here to help you guide you through that process. We provide resources, information, and trainings for all of those involved in California agritourism with the goal of helping farmers and ranchers diversify their income, increase their resiliency. We also research the impact of agritourism and foster a statewide network, which we are actively looking for ways to keep growing and deepening the impact of that network. I want to point you to a few resources. We have the California Agritourism website. This is for primarily for you farmers and ranchers. Um, there are plenty of resources on all of the considerations, many of the considerations that you might want to make and tools to help you get started or expand. There are guides, fact sheets, budget templates that you can fill on, etc. Then we have the California Agricultural Tourism Directory, which is a free listing um, for all agritourism operations in California can list there and the public uh, can visit this website and find you and learn a little bit about what you're doing. And then we have our California Agritourism Newsletter, which is a quarterly e-newsletter that has 
resources, updates, information about the agritourism community here in California. And I will put links to each of these in the chat when I'm finished. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Alda. Uh, thank you, Rachel, um, for the introduction. And let's see if I can share my presentation. Uh, okay, so do I need it down here? So, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. And uh, as Rachel mentioned, I'm an extension specialist with the School of Veterinary Medicine, and my work in the past has been or has been um, mostly working with small scale uh, diversified farms with animals and also uh, backyard owners looking at different aspects in terms of um, animal health, biosecurity, and, and pre-harvest food safety. So for this in the first um, presentation, is a, uh, a, a combined presentation with uh, Dr. Di Francesco that she'll speak after. Uh, I just want to give an overview what is biosecurity and general concepts and also like to acknowledge this is part of a bigger project with our collaborators um, at Washington State and, and College of Veterinary Medicine at, at Colorado. So there is a whole series of resources. I will give some, the links later on about biosecurity for small farms. Um, what yes, here we go. So what is biosecurity? Biosecurities are actions that we take to prevent and control diseases either in humans, animals, and plants. In this talk, we're talking about animals. So, so those measures are taking place to prevent the introduction of diseases, new diseases on farm, or uh, reduce the spread, the transmission of disease once you have already that disease on your farm. Um, so what we classify the diseases or the sources of these disease pathogens in different um types of pathogens and it's important to understand which pathogen we are dealing with and so we can prevent or decrease the transmission of those diseases so the pathogens can be bacteria as salmonella uh, pathogenic e coli uh, q fever uh, parasites as roundworms or coccidia virus even influenza that has been um affecting us for the last year or so in, in the united states rabies and so on, the SARS are also, COVID-19 is a virus, fungi is the ringworm, and then they have the pions, uh, BSC, that's very rare in the United States. So there is different types of pathogens classified in different um, types, and that understanding how they behave and all this transmission uh, help us to prevent their introduction in, in, in on a farm or a uh, spread between animals so <coughs> excuse me <coughs> so there is how, how what are the main routes of transmission of the disease there's several one known is um aerosol aerosol so moisture of droplets they are they contain some of these pathogens and they can um, transmit it through air or inhalation either when there's coughing sneezing or breathing or also contaminate environments uh, ingestion oral, so animal ingests the, the, those pathogens either by contaminate feed, water, or contaminate objects, and when they share water and feed sources. Uh, direct contact through either the mucosas, membranes, or skin, or open homes on, on, on skin, where you have body fluids and tissues with uh, inf from infect animals, as saliva, uh, feces, and milk. Fomites, so what is fomites? It's, it's uh, contaminate um, objects or surfaces as the equipment we use, um, the, our clothing, our shoes, bedding, they can be contaminated and be one of the routes for transmission of those diseases. Uh, some of these pathogens, they can survive for hours, some actually can survive for weeks or months in those environments. And final, vectors so will be an animal or living organism as mosquito sticks that they transfer the disease from one animal to another animal an example is west nile virus 
that spurs me to buy mosquitoes. So there is uh, many different routes of transmission of disease. And those routes, they depend on different uh, agents for specific disease. And also it's important to understand that many of these diseases, they have more than one route. Normally there is one predominant, but, um, but most of the disease we know, they have more than one way to, to for uh, transmission. Uh, and some of those actually, the animals, they look healthy. So they may have that disease, that pathogen, but they are healthy that don't show any disease. So understand this transmission, there's different ways. Um, help us to how we can prevent the transmission. And so it goes back to biosecurity practice. And for today, we're just dividing in six, and I will mention some of them very briefly. What practice we put in place um, in these main groups. And then it'll be related to wildlife and pest control, cleaning and disinfection of equipment and vehicles, the best uh, practice for husbandry, so it's keeping the animals healthy. Traffic control means uh, the movement of people, vehicles and equipment, and also movement of animals. And final management of the litter. So if you understand the disease all transmitted and put in practice how in these different uh, groups, how to prevent the transmission of those diseases. Start with animal movement. So think about when you're moving animals from on and off from your premises. So the introduction of new animals, if you're going to have young stock, um, they can bring diseases to, to your farm. So it's important to understand which farms are coming, what are their uh, health protocols, and also return animals from shows, breeding, uh, grazing pastures, when take the veterinary, also they can also bring new disease to, to your uh, farm. So how we can prevent those, uh, the introduction of disease to understand those biosecurity steps. So when you have new animals, uh, it's important to bring, when you bring new animals, to bring those or buy those animals from farms or places they are disease free from those uh, mostly concerned of farms. And I'm not going to be much specific, but looking at, for example, poultry, if you buy your chicks, buy from a hatchery, that's part of what we call National Poultry Improvement Plan. So they are part of this program, National Plan, that they have um, vaccination uh, programs, they are uh, free of set from salmonella pleura and so on. And the same applies for other animals understand what those farms are put in place, if they control for disease, if they uh, vaccinate, and so on. Also, minimize the number of sources of herds. So frequently in these small farms or agro settings, we have to buy the new animals from outside sources. So find a source that's reliable and minimize the number of sources that will be also important. Um, when transport these new animals, Think about how we're going to transport them on cleaning, disinfect those trailers or crates. And once you have the new animals, um, have a quarantine period. What is the quarantine? Is a time that you isolate those new animals from your resident animals. Ideally, time will be 21, 30 days. So you have time to look and do they develop new signs of disease, you have time to test them, vaccinate, and so on and keep records, not just for the new animals, but as well for your um, farm animals. It's important records on vaccination, what they were tested, and so on. So proper care and, and keeping healthy animals is crucial to prevent disease. And part of that is of those care includes provide clean water, good uh, bedding, good care and adequate diet. Uh, have a vaccination dorming program, so work with your veterinarian. Uh, start working early with a veterinarian and, and develop what we call VCPR, is um, veterinary client patient relationship. So they will can guide you what the best protocols for vaccination, how to keep a herd, uh, healthy herd, and so on. Um, as a practice as well, when you have animals of different age, start with working when you're going to feed them, clean their, their pens, et cetera. Start working with the health and young animals first, and then older than the ones in quarantine and sick animals last. We understand some of our settings are relatively small, 
and can be difficult to keep, you know, separate animals. And here I just give an example of a quarantine pen for poultry that was developed by our colleague, Dr. Piteski. So there are some resources out there how to uh, for uh, help you to come up on some of those quarantine pens. And also daily the animals for any signs of disease. Once they are sick, isolate those sick animals from the rest of the, the herd or flock. So moving to the cleaning and disinfection, I will talk very briefly. Uh, so what's just kind of um, overall what's cleaning is cleaning is the first step and help us to remove the soil and organic material from the surfaces and disinfection is the physical chemical agents to kill germs. Um, so the cleaning and disinfection together, they can help to stop the spread of pathogens, either by inactivating those germs or destroying. Um, <clears throat> and so the cleaning and disinfection applies to animal areas, equipment, vehicles, and, and personal to hand washing. And it's important to have a protocol for whatever adequate for your pen. So of course, cleaning and disinfection from a Paddock that have concrete will be different from a paddock that will be on, on, on dirt. Um, have those di different protocols that's adequate for your settings, for your pens or equipment, and understand also what type of the products you should use or not, facing the, uh, the diseases presence or you want to avoid, and also um, uh, the disease and type of equipment that you can use, different disinfectants. And this slide, I just want to point out that the first four steps actually help to remove the germs 80%. And those steps is the pre-cleaning of debris, so to remove the dirt, apply the soak and foamy soap to remove, also have help to remove that um, the organic matter, wash and dirt and, and wash, wash away the, the dirt and rinse, and final drain and dry. And dry. So it's four steps actually helps to remove 80% of your germs and, and organic matter. And then 20% will be removed by disinfectants. And I'm not spending much time about talking about disinfectants. We have fact sheets and different um, uh, fact sheets for different disinfectants for different pathogens and what they can, their um, action and, and so on. But understand that is the right, is that the right disinfectant? Is that the right concentration, the consistency and time of contact? And that all depends what animals are working with and also what disease will try to prevent. So for example, chlorine, uh, we know that gets inactivated to organic matter. So if we didn't do a good job of removing the, uh, the, the first four steps, removing that organic matter, the Clorox is not going, or chlorine products is not going to work. Another aspect of biosecurity is movement, what they call traffic control, is movement of people, vehicles, and equipment. And um, Juliet is going to talk a little bit more about visitors and what to take in, in, in a consideration here. I'm just going to overall. So we know that people visit as employees, we can bring. Uh, disease to, to, the, to the animals, and the disease applies in agro-tourism settings on a big farms. Um, so having, it's important, special on this agro-tourism, having what we call outside inside of animal areas. Which animal areas you want the visitors have uh, contact or experience with? And, and that's, that's one of the things to think about, and think about do I minimize number of visitors or or should I have a number of records record keeping of the visitors are visiting? And that's important, it's important because if those visitors have animals at home, if they use the same shoes to, to care their uh, animals at home and bring some diseases to in their shoes, also some consideration about international traveling. Um, as we have some disease they are eradicating in our country and we don't want those uh, bring home. So each, each of farming might have their um, policy for visitors and employees, depending on biosecurity, but things to consider which animals you want to have, provide experience and expose to visitors. Uh, that's important in our planning for your uh, agro-tourism settings. 
Keep talking about, so then another thing is, uh, we did, we'll talk more about that. Wash your hands before and after animal contact is either if you are tending the animals or feeding them or vis for the visit experience. Uh, dedicate clothes and, and food to wear and there's different reasons. Some of these farms, they have also vests also, or we should have dedicated clothes and footwear for the animals which should be separate for other activities on farm. Um, eventually have disposable boot coverings or a, a foot bath and the foot bath they are as good as we can keep them clean and, and depends of, of the settings and not allow the heating and drinking animal areas is also important. Then moving just briefly to the wildlife and pest control. We know that wildlife and special rodents, they can bring, and birds as well, they can bring disease to your farm. And one way to attract these wildlife actually is, is the feed. So it's important to secure all feed storage areas and clean them after. And um, so here's some example, for example, having uh, your um, feed storage with a lid and, and well um, away or at least in a sh sh uh, shade as for example that will uh, minimize the contact with wildlife. I, and then another example sometimes when they have pasture-based systems we know that the birds and the crows and so on they are waiting right away for the animals being fed and, and they just have like come over and, and you know it's it's difficult to control come over and, and feed from, um, eat from the animal feed. So there is different ways that you can keep wildlife away, either electric fences, coyotes or fox decoys and so on. Uh, birds is harder. Uh, some of the, with poultry uh, owners, they use net uh, hooks. Uh, so understanding what is your risks on the farm also will help you to, to prevent or minimize that control with wildlife. And finally, just talk a little bit of manure and, and manure litter bedding management. And um, consider, so um, are we able to have, one of the risks is, you know, if you have sick animals, some of these animals, uh, they might share their pathogens on manure. So manure can be a source of, of diseases and how we handle that manure and that bedding. Ideally world, we'll have a separate equipment to handle uh, manure and uh, litter or uh, or fresh bedding and feed. Not always is possible. If not, have a protocol for cleaning and disinfection between different uses. Also think about where I'm going to put the manure for those animals. What I'm going to do with that. If it's a pasture system where they know they just deposit along the pasture, rotate the pastures. But if you have a, some sort of bedding and enclose those animals thinking, I'll have manure so what i store what i'm going to store those manure should be away from water sources and uh, prevent runoff away should not be access to the animal so the animal sometimes should not climb on those piles so there is not a, a recontamination and think about should i compost or not and composting is a thermophilic process that actually helps to um Degradate the organic matter and and and, and oh, as well kills the some of pathogens of concern. So think about if we're getting new animals. It's not just animals. How we manage also the, the manure and do we have space? Or maybe some I have some see some some farms. I just send send to another place and have those uh, manure storage in a different place, not the, on their property. So with that, there was a very brief overview of biosecurity, what means biosecurity, different steps that includes uh, wildlife control, introduction of new animals, um, visitors and employees, um, manure management, and I think I'm missing someone because there are six, but um, there is, we have a part of this project, we have a website, it's called Farm PPE, it means Farm Animal Risk Mitigation, Prepare, Prevent, and Evaluate. We have a series of nine webinars. Uh, they have access. They go in deep on these concepts. And it is a QR code, and we will provide that, uh, the link as well. With that, hence my seminar, my uh, talk, and then we'll have Juliet next talking specifically for agritourism um, setting. Okay, stop sharing.
Yep, I'll go ahead and share mine. Um, okay. So, sorry, having is oh, sorry, I I had a problem with that. Okay. Is it all good? Okay. Yes, all good. Thank yeah. you. So hello, I'm uh, Julia Di Francesco, and so I'm a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the University of California, Davis. And today I'll be talking to you about the best practices for visitor interactions uh, with animals and particularly about the prevention of zoonosis. And so a lot of the materials that I use uh, to develop a presentation can be found on the Center for Food Security and Public Health website, as well as our uh, project website that Alda just mentioned. So a zoonosis is a disease whose pathogen can be transmitted from animals to humans or vice versa. And the secondary um, transmission from human to human is possible for some of these pathogens, uh, such as Ebola virus, for example, that you might have heard of um, in Africa. So here you can see uh, how important zoonotic diseases are. Um, they represent 60% of existing uh, human infectious diseases and um, at least 75% of emerging infectious diseases of humans, so that's including Ebola, HIV, and influenza, so the flu, have an animal origin. And among approximately five new human diseases that appear every year, three of them are of animal origin. And finally, 80% of agents with potential bioterrorist use are zoonotic pathogens, um, such as the agents of Q fever, for example, and anthrax. So three main elements contribute to the risk of zoonotic disease. First, the pathogen itself. Second, uh, human risk factors, which include uh, behaviors such as the awareness of zoonotic diseases, the use of personal protective equipment and personal hygiene. And then the type of setting will be particularly important with some settings uh, being at higher risk than others. And finally, uh, individual characteristics with uh, certain individuals and populations at higher risk than others. And third, there's animal risk factors such as uh, poor animal health and sanitation, poor management and intensive production. And I'm gonna go uh, through these in a bit more details. So first, regarding the human risk factors, uh, populations and individuals at um, higher risk of zoonotic disease include uh, children under five years of age, adults under uh, 65 years of age, uh, people with a weakened immune system, so people living with HIV or AIDS, chronic diseases, uh, people undergoing chemotherapy, uh, transplant patients, and immunocompromised patients, um, and then there's uh, pregnant individuals and uh, people without previous livestock exposure because they uh, consequently may not have immunity to certain diseases. And finally, uh, those who practice professions uh, where they are in close contact with animals or their products, such as uh, livestock producers, uh, veterinarians, zookeepers, and abattoir workers. So high risk settings will uh, include at risk practices, such as um, assisting with the delivery of newborn animals, uh, milking, um, bar cleaning the barn, um, eating or drinking unpasteurized milk or raw and uh, undercooked meat. And they will also include uh, public settings, which bring people in close contact with animals, such as uh, farm tours and agritourism operations, uh, petting zoos, fairs, livestock birthing exhibits, and educational exhibits at schools. So for the um, transmission routes, I'm not going to go uh, into these details since Alda already mentioned them. Um, so we have aerosol transmission, direct contact, ingestion, so oral transmission, fomite, and vector. And just the main key things to remember are that transmission routes vary with disease agents and that many pathogens can be transmitted by more than one route. So regarding uh, human-animal interactions, one crucial thing to have in mind is that animals 
may not show obvious signs of disease when they're infected. In other words, they can be entirely asymptomatic and appear healthy. And it's important to keep in mind that the zoonotic disease risk will never be totally eliminated because zoonotic agents are present both in animals and in the environment. They are numerous and they can be transmitted by multiple routes as we just saw. So prevention really is gonna be the key control measure uh, for zoonotic diseases. And so it's important to identify the risk areas and risky behaviors in order to develop uh, really targeted mit risk mitigation strategies. And it will also be crucial to uh, decrease exposure through adaptive preventive measures in order to minimize the threat to both animals and humans. So agritourism, as we said, comes with uh, some challenges that uh, it's associated with health risks. So to both your animals and also to the people visiting the farm. And so these animal health risks are linked to the fact that visitors can bring diseases onto the farm. So particularly those that we're gonna call kind of high risk. Uh, so these people will come from other animal operations. Uh, some will have uh, recently traveled internationally or also uh, people who have health issues. And so what can you do to reduce the risk for your animals? So some of the uh, risk mitigation and prevention strategies include um, having some hand sanitizers at the entrance, um, keeping all exhibited animals up to date on their vaccines and parasite control. Uh, you can also provide a guest sign-in sheet to log all visitors in and also maybe ask if they have traveled recently. Um, you can place signs at the entrance and in visiting areas, which provide uh, detailed instructions to visitors about the rules on the farms to follow and also directing them to wash hands following contact with animals. And areas that are not open to the public should be uh, clearly marked with signs and, and closed off. And then uh, you should clearly mark uh, the tour routes or uh, also another option is to have a staff guide the visits. And finally, restrict access of pets to service animals only. So there can also be health risks to your visitors as they can potentially be exposed to zoonotic pathogens uh, through direct and indirect contact with animals and the environment, or also through the consumption of farm products and food that may be served on site depending on your operations. And so in this case, uh, the risk uh, mitigation and prevention strategies will include uh, having a dedicated animals and pens for visitor experience, and observing your animals uh, daily to check for signs of illness. If any animal appears to be sick, remove them obviously from the public area and isolate them from other animals. Um, regularly clean and disinfect the animal areas. Um, avoid moving manure, bedding and other waste material in public areas where guests walk. And do not allow guests to participate in activities associated with the birth of newborn animals, as this may be a really highly stressful time in, um, for the animals. And certain pathogens, such as the agents of Q fever, are at higher risk of being transmitted during birthing. And also, it's recommended uh, not to allow guests to handle newborn and young animals. So continuing on our risk mitigation and prevention strategies for visitors, um, obviously not eating or drinking in animal areas and not allowing personal belongings into animal areas as these can become contaminated. And these really include uh, everything from strollers, bags, pacifiers, cups, toys, bottles, anything that the visitors will bring with them. And so you should provide uh, an area designated for people to store all these items and post signs really explaining why you're asking this, that it is for the safety of both uh, people and animals. And so when possible, uh, groups visiting animal areas should move in one direction only. So really single uh, flow, as you can see on uh, the top map here. So that's kind of like the ideal setting where you have like a uh, uh, an entrance and then a transition area uh, to the animal area and uh, then uh, another transition at the exit where you have your hand washing stations. It's they, they haven't shown here, but it's also good if you can have hand sanitizing stations at the entrance and then you would have your storage area before the, uh, the uh, people enter uh, the transition here. 
And then obviously that's not doable in all sorts of, in all the premises. So then you have kind of uh, an alternative option uh, where you would have a kind of like a double uh, flow, but um, with again, uh, a, a single transition area where you would have your um, hand washing stations and obviously before again, the storage area. And so um, hand washing stations, uh, as we said, should be uh, available next to animal contact areas and also in uh, concession areas. And uh, signs should be really posted to remind all guests to wash their hands after uh, touching the animals. And finally, if food or beverages are provided for guests, they should be served, prepared and eaten in areas that are separate from where you keep the animals. And you should uh, follow all state and local health department guidelines for this. So now I wanted to go in a little bit more details um, on a common zoonotic disease called salmonellosis. And so these, this disease is due to salmonella bacteria uh, who, that live in the intestinal tract of many different animals and humans. Um, carrier animals often uh, are often asymptomatic and appear healthy. And estimates of a prevalence of carrier rates, so that's the percentage of animals that carry the bacteria, among reptiles vary from 36% to more than 80 or 90%. So these are particularly high risk animals for salmonellosis. And high prevalence rates can also be present in some birds and mammals, such as chickens and turkeys. Um, and so salmonella bacteria are shed in the feces of infected animals intermittently, and they can easily contaminate uh, the body, so the fur or the feathers of animals and their environments. And really multiple factors uh, will affect the intensity and occurrence of the shedding, including animal AIDS. So it's particularly high in young animals. Animal density and stress will also increase um, shedding. And so salmonellosis outbreaks linked to contact uh, with animals and animal products are actually frequently reported throughout the US. And here you can see uh, some examples of the animal species and animal products that were involved in these outbreaks between 2016 and 2020, uh, 2022. So we have poultry, pet turtles, um, pig and ear dog treats, a uh, bit of everything. So transmission of salmonellosis to humans uh, really most commonly occurs through the ingestion of raw or undercooked milk, eggs or milk and dairy products and contaminated produce or water. But people can also get salmonellosis, uh, as we said, through direct contact with feces from infected animals, um, uh, or after touching an infected animal if hands are not washed properly afterwards, or also through uh, contact with contaminated environments or objects. And there is a rare secondary person-to-person -person transmission that is also possible. So regarding the prevention of salmonellosis in your animals, uh, good biosecurity practices are really the key, and those were already detailed by ALDA. Um, and so the risk of introducing salmonellosis into uh, your herd or flock can be decreased uh, by buying animals or eggs from salmonella-free sources, um, isolating newly acquired animals, and practicing an all-in-all-out system uh, for management where it's appropriate, obviously. And so during an outbreak, uh, carrier animals should be identified and either isolated and treated or culled, um, and contaminated buildings and equipment should be cleaned and disinfected. And so the occurrence of clinical salmonellosis and also of shedding can be decreased by uh, good hygiene, minimizing stress, and also uh, vaccines are available for some serovars and species of salmonella, but unfortunately do not protect fully. And so how can we uh, protect ourselves? Um, well, no vaccines to prevent salmonellosis exist. So measures to uh, reduce the risk of foodborne uh, salmonellosis will include uh, avoiding raw or undercooked eggs and meat, as well as unpasteurized um, milk and dairy products, uh, thoroughly washing your hands, uh, sorry, thoroughly washing and or peeling raw vegetables and fruits before eating them. And finally, avoiding cross-contamination of food. So really keeping your uncooked and cooked foods separate and washing your hands and kitchen tools after handling uh, raw foods. 
And so measures to reduce the risk of transmission from animal contact will include thoroughly washing your uh, hands after contact with animals or their feces. And this will be especially important after visiting petting zoos or agritourism farms or being in contact with high risk animals, uh, which we mentioned include uh, reptiles and young animals such as chicks and ducklings. And finally, uh, high risk individuals should be aware of these risks and particularly careful and limit their exposure. And so um, here are some additional resources on zoonoses uh, that you can, are all available through our website. And I really recommend this tip sheet here that summarizes uh, most of the information I mentioned today. And it also includes a checklist at the end to, uh, for you guys to fill out and make sure um, you're, uh, you're following the, the tips on your premise. And so with that, uh, thank you for your attention. And I put the QR code for our website again here. Thank you so much, Julia. That was wonderful. Um, again, just a reminder, we will answer questions at the end. Please feel free to post them in the chat. And now I would love to introduce Maureen Mercado and turn over to you. And while you're speaking, I'm going to scroll through some beautiful pictures of your operation. So take okay. it away, Maureen. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I've got to say that we've been doing yagua tourism uh, in one form or another for the 18 plus years we've had alpacas and llamas. And uh, the references that they have given are ones we've used and we continually revise what we're doing. Um, I did participate in the uh, PPE seminar and I highly recommend doing that. And also when you get done with, um, with that, we were very fortunate, this is backwards, that um, received a biosecurity plan where they came, uh, veterinary staff, Alda and Juliet, and another couple others came out and went through the ranch. If you're looking at the picture, uh, we actually have the one in, one out uh, protocol on our ranch. They come in through an area that is um, enclosed. It's partially to prevent any animals from accidentally getting out. There's a hand washing station, hand sanitizers, um, a list of instructions. The Alpaca Owners Association has some fantastic information on it, and there are links that um, Dr. Pears, Juliet, and Rachel have shared that I would highly recommend that you obtain. The signage is important. Uh, we've worked with our veterinarian. We've worked with our insurance agent. In fact, our insurance agent came out and uh, did a walkthrough and said, everything's good. You have the hand sanitizer, you have the hand wash station, no food or beverages. We do not allow pets. Unfortunately, we don't even allow service animals. Um, we have 100 year old cottonwood trees. So we trim the suckers and visitors then feed the animals the leaves off of the suckers. Alpacas are, are not um, the little cuddly things that many people see on the internet. We have our public relations group. This is a select group of females that interact with the visitors. They are kept separate from the other animals. Uh, we do follow very strict protocols with our animal movement. Um, animals that are in for breeding or out for breeding are in isolation paddocks for uh, 14 to 20 days when they either return, when they return or come in. Um, I do fecal checks. Um, that's a yoga picture. We've got yoga coming up this weekend. Folks come in. Again, it's our public relations group. Um, so folks lay out the mats and the alpacas wander around and kind of give critiques on people's form. Um, but there's no eating. You see some water bottles there, but that's pretty, pretty minimal. Um, and um, we, we don't recommend that they have beverages there, but the animals just kind of wander around. Again, alpacas are a little different. They tend to defecate and urinate in one central area. So that makes it a lot easier for cleanup than it would when we had goats and sheep and our chickens are kept cooped up. It's amazing how many city people are afraid of chickens. 
So, you know, just to avoid that whole thing. Um, we have instituted a foot wash station. It's a pad that has um, uh, a disinfectant on it for people to step in as they walk in. We get a number of um, Bay Area people who are strictly non-rural people. They come in their sandals. We do have when they, uh, we have tickets. So we have ticketed times. And that started with COVID that really um, made us be more secure and more aware of biosecurity and of the number of people coming in and out of the property. So our one area that, so we do have, um, we don't let people handle the babies. Nobody assists with the birthing. Fortunately, most alpacas don't need help with that. Um, we have had people watch birthing from separate area. You can see the fence in the back there. So when we've had very pregnant females, they're back in back of the fence there. So we have had at a paint party, we had Bob Ross born and uh, we had, I don't know, because everybody kept asking me his name. Both of those alpacas were born with about 60 people watching. The caveat with that is if we see anything going on that we need to um, interact with, then we will ask people to give us some space. Um, but biosecurity, this is at an ag day at a fairgrounds. So we don't have animals there for this particular one. Uh, the young man I was showing you how to spin. We also do drop spindling with people. Yeah, um, yeah. So our insurance agent really worked hard, and we work with our county. We're pretty fortunate too. We have um, a big lavender farm and event center just down the road. We have Hillmar Cheese for food, so we do a three-way stop with buses and with other locations. So we coordinate with that. So they tend to eat. And um, Juliet there likes to critique and likes to pick up paint brushes. So I don't know, she's, she does her own thing there. Uh, paint parties are, are pretty good. Again, we have people set up. There's no eating or drinking when we have those things. We have a separate area. We're like Disneyland, everybody exits through the store. So um, kind of brand new building, it's an 18 by 25, um, so people can wander through. And we have samples of fleeces, of the different types of fleeces for people to touch at that point. And again, hand sanitizer right there. Um, and we have signs, you know, about the possibility. We have them in English, Spanish, and I think Hmong are the three languages that we have them printed up in. And there you can see the alpacas checking out the uh, paint party. That was a drought year, by the way. So you can tell not much pasture there. This year it's nice and green. We have sandy soil, so we do not have a lot of, um, a lot of standing water. Uh, it soaks right in. We do compost. Uh, we're a carbon beneficial grant recipient. So we compost in an area of the ranch. And this was something that um, Alda, told us we needed to work on and we did. So we now compost in an area away from the animal traffic um, that's composted and then it's spread in areas of our field. Those areas are kept, um, separated animals are not allowed on it until the pastures have regenerated. So we do a little rotational grazing. Um, pretty, pretty fortunate with where we are. Fences keep the critters out. Raccoons and foxes come in, not much I can do about that but um, that's kept to a minimal and we do keep an eye on that. So not sure what time I've got, but again, I highly recommend that you go to the agritourism site that um, Rachel has. There's a book that is well worth the money, lots of good references, lots of good information and sources for you to obtain information. Work with your insurance agent Every group is different. Every location is different. We're not in a high fire area. So we have a totally different insurance. We have a farm insurance separate from our house insurance. And again, that was done based on the fact that um, insurance is a, is a big deal when you have agritourism. You need to really make sure you've got your liability covered, both for your animals. We have mortality insurance on our animals and that you've got liability for your visitors. 
we used to have miniature horses. Our insurance agent said that would require a different, uh, extremely expensive policy, even if folks didn't interact with them. So actually sold my horses to a young lady who does unicorn birthday parties with them. And uh, so my former stud gets uh, glittered and painted in pink and a little unicorn horn and wings put on him. And that, so um, it's kind of what we do. So you know, I guess we can open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, this is the um, book and sorry, it's backwards here. Um, but it allows me to put everything in place. They gave me a checklist. They did a map showing everything, showing the sites that we needed to work on. Uh, parking is kind of the big deal here. We're in narrow 10 acres. So we do have one pasture that serves double purpose, but animals are kept out of it for about a week after we've had big groups come through. But this is nice for my ranch sitters. This has everything in one place now. So I can leave this for the ranch sitter. It's got all the information, has links to and phone numbers for a veterinarian insurance whole bit. So again, highly recommend that. Thank you, Maureen, for, for mentioning our work. And I didn't mention in my presentation, but as part of this farm PPE, we're offering to the to small scale different farms to do on-site visit and walk through their their premises and and uh, looking at you know what was um, what are they having in place based on those different practices I mentioned and what we can improve and then we have a second visit uh, with suggestions and we left this dossier that was kind of customized to each farm and uh, and Maureen was we we have minimal actually. <laughs> minimal things to, to mention. She has been doing things for so long and has a very neat setting. Uh, but there is always place to improve. And as, as you know, the visits are changed and different activities we're offering. And, and, and that's part of it. We are about ending on this project in summer. But if someone in the audience would like to have some assessment, we can, we can come up with, with some time with, um, until the summer and, and, and talk about it. So basically map out that their premises and where the animals, what different activities. And, and we just found out each farm is, is unique and actually needs this, you know, these discussions. Even we have those templates online, it's important to work with, you know, you can work with your veterinarian or someone to come up with some of those um, plans or yeah, biosecurity plans. 